Hello there. This is part two of the marketing lecture. Uh, in part one, we covered a lot of material, uh, general issues about marketing, and we specifically got into aspects of the marketing mix. Uh, we discussed uh, product uh, development and so forth, and as well as pricing considerations. In this video, we're going to discuss distribution and promotion. So here we go. Okay, uh, products need to get from wherever we manufacture them, um, you know, whether it's a product or a service, and we somehow need to get them to our consumer or our final customer. And there are many distribution channels or methods. Uh, the first is direct, where we ship directly from where it's created, from the factory to directly to the consumer. And many companies do engage in this. You know, you think of a company like L.L. Bean, they send out their catalogs, they have their websites. Um, you could buy a computer directly from Dell or Apple or a bunch of other companies. Uh, so that's a fairly straightforward uh, uh, way of distributing. Um, however, previous to the internet, it was somewhat limited um, because you'd have people would have to get the catalog or some other direct method. Uh, normally, they would go through uh, products would go through various intermediaries, such as a retailer, uh, you know, and in fact, there's still quite a few retailers. So that would create that also create the need for wholesalers. And so your product would be uh, purchased by a wholesaler or a large chain, uh, then uh, sold to uh, the individual retailer and then eventually sold to the consumer. And this is a more traditional uh, form of uh, distribution. Uh, even if you look at Amazon, uh, Amazon is an intermediary. It's kind of a combination of a wholesaler and retailer. Uh, I mean, actually, it very much is a retailer. It's an online retailer, just like any other store, just, you know, doesn't have a physical brick and mortar presence. And so, you know, there are all sorts of way to, ways to distribute. In addition, we have brokers. Now, brokers are uh, distribution intermediaries, but they never actually take um, physical uh, or, uh, you know, or ownership of the product that's being passed through them. And of course, brokers uh, can work through all of the uh, channels. And even wholesalers can sell directly to consumers. So it's a very, can be a very complex uh, uh, decision in choosing how to distribute your product. Uh, obviously, there are some very strong retailers, such as you know, Walmart, uh, where a lot of people go to buy their products. And so while may, people may think it would be ideal to go directly from the manufacturer to the consumer, and often that does happen, in many ways, for instance, like for groceries, it's much easier to go to a store, to a supermarket or uh, someplace like Walmart to pick up a range of products uh, that you might like. Um, and distributors do provide uh, a certain value. Uh, their location, you know, instead of uh, walking, you know, going to specialty stores, or, well, you can go to specialty stores. Um, uh, is there, there's a local, there is a convenience to being local. Um, also, some distributors, uh, so, well, some products require special storage, which those distributors will uh, offer. And that may be refrigeration, freezing, um, humidity control for things like cigars and other types of uh, products that uh, are affected by humidity. In some cases, you might need special licenses, like uh, you know, if you want to uh, sell lobsters for consumption, uh, you have to get a live animal uh, license you know, to, to, to ship and store live animals, because you don't want your lobsters dying and then uh, and then being cooked, you want them, you know, apparently that's not a good thing. Um, when I uh, worked for, uh, in the corporate world, I, and the internet first started, uh, one of the assignments I was given was to assess the possibility of distributing vaccines uh, directly to uh, people using the internet. Um, and one of the problems we came up with was that, well, yes, we could get FedEx or some other shipper to distribute, but often they leave things on the back, on, on a doorstep and vaccines require refrigeration and we'd have no idea how long 
of that would uh, take. Now, recently with the, uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, people became aware of actually requires uh, even more specialized storage, uh, you know, ultra, ultra cold freezing. And that, that makes it much more difficult uh, to, <clears throat> to distribute. And so the individual distributors, the various intermediary, intermediaries bring a certain value in if they have that special storage, you know, freezers for the ice cream in the supermarket and, uh, you know, other types of uh, special storage. Um, distributors also have a more intimate knowledge of consumer needs and desires. Um, you know, how do they buy? What type of products do they like? That sort of thing. Uh, and that can be very useful if we uh, want them to guide consumers to our product. Uh, often the consumer decision of, over which product to buy is often uh, guided by uh, a sales rep or a clerk in a store. Uh, I remember once going to Home Depot, I needed to seal my driveway. I had never done it before. And I saw all these products and I had to ask uh, somebody at Home Depot, could you give me some advice? And I was primarily looking at three products. And uh, first question he asked, uh, the, the sales, the clerk asked me or the um, in-store person asked me was, uh, are you planning on selling your home soon? I said, no, I didn't understand why that was relevant. He said, well, if you were, I'd recommend this one over here. It's very inexpensive but it only lasts a few years. But if you're selling your home, it doesn't matter because you, you, know, you won't own it after, after a while. And, and okay, I saw, I saw his point there. And he said, this one over here is the most expensive and it is the best. It is an excellent product. Um, this is what they use on uh, raceways and on uh, <clears throat> uh, runways at airports. It's, a, it's sort of industrial grade sealing of, of the asphalt. And he said, probably what you need is this other one sort of in the middle. It's sort of the Goldilocks uh, choice. Um, and I, I would not have no idea. I might have gone for the cheapest or might have gone for the other one. But this person guided me very carefully to the right product. And of course, that's what you want uh, is you want, <clears throat> from the manufacturer's perspective, you want uh, people in the distribution channel to guide consumers uh, or end consumers to your product. Um, in fact, that's often why many companies offer training. Uh, I, uh, years later, years ago, I had to replace the tile uh, in my shower. It was tiles were literally falling off, and we discovered that the previous owner of our house had done a really crappy job. And uh, maybe knowing he was going to sell, I don't know. But um, we bought a, pr a product called Corian. It's actually plastic, but it's a high density plastic. It feels like marble. And, and the sales rep told us all about it, how we could use it and how it would work. And I said, well, you're really knowledgeable about this. Oh yeah. He said, I went to Corian school for two days. Corian was created by the DuPont company. And they said, they invited me, us to learn about Corian. They paid for us to come and you know, we went, I went to Corian school. Um, and that is not out of the, uh, you know, that, that's for a reason. DuPont wants those retail sales reps to push people towards their product. So they educate them about the product. Um, another important point, uh, aspect obviously is the in-between, the transportation. How do we get our products from our factory or wherever we originate the product uh, to, you know, to our end user? Um, Railroads, uh, although it seems like a, a 19th century technology, is still very much in use today. Uh, lots of people, uh, lots of companies use railroads. It is a, uh, is a very cost-effective way, and it seems counterintuitive. I remember asking somebody, uh, I remember there was this, uh, I, I had to wait while a train, at a train crossing, and I counted about 80 uh, cars. I said, wow, that must cost a lot to move that train. And this person who actually knew somebody, something about trains with me says, no, no, actually it's about five, five miles a gallon. And I thought, well, you know, that's awful. Well, that's, uh, for a car, that's a horrible mileage, but for a train. And I said, how, how is that possible? And he said, well, first off, it doesn't do a lot of stopping and starting. Um, there are no potholes on a railroad. Uh, and so it just keeps on going and the momentum of it keeps it going. 
they're not easy to start and not easy to stop, but as long as they're going along at the same rate of speed, uh, they're very cost effective uh, you know, in terms of fuel. And much of the product we uh, you know, buy has traveled by railroad. Uh, now, of course, there are water carriers um, because our planet is 75% uh, uh, ocean or sea. Um, so a lot of uh, anything we're importing from overseas has to go by a water carrier. And you may have, many of you may have seen these ships with all these um, containers on them. If you, if you wa ever watch the end of the movie Castaway, where Tom Hanks is rescued by a, a ship, and it's a ship that has all these uh, containers on it, and it's, it's shipping product. Um, air, airship shipment is more expensive, but it is much faster. Railroads and water are a little bit slower. That's, so it's a little bit more cost effective, but uh, if a customer is willing to pay for shipping, um, and it's amazing, we can, we can get uh, you know, products, you know, like let's say from here in New Jersey to Australia in, in, within 24 hours. I actually shipped something to India one time and it took several days, but it actually got to India within a day. Uh, most of the time it took to get to the person I was sending this to was actually within India. Uh, you know, getting from one point to India to another. Um, so air transportation is very quick. Uh, obviously, things that have a lot of weight to them, it's not as cost effective. So uh, generally, uh, we ship airship lightweight things or things that are small relative to their, you know, uh, valuable relative to their weight. Um, now, probably most important transportation method is trucking. Um, um, you know, most of us don't live by an airport or by a dock or you know, by a railway station. Um, eventually, things will have to be offloaded from uh, the rail car or from the uh, ship or from the plane. And trucks, trucks are wonderful. They, they go wherever there's a road and some places where there aren't roads. Uh, so that's a, that's a great method. And because of this, we have developed intermodal uh, sometimes referred to as piggyback carriers. Um, and if you've ever traveled on Route 1 and 9 in New Jersey, north of the Newark Airport, uh, it's an elevated um, uh, highway uh, heading up to the Pulaski Skyway, uh, you can actually see a lot of these intermodal containers. Uh, they were probably originally on ships. They can be put on flatbed trucks for rail, uh, for, uh, rail cars. Uh, you can put them on the back of a truck. This means they don't have to be loaded and unloaded, and that is about reducing uh, the cost and the time and cost of transportation. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, we also have pipelines, and you know, for things like you know, gas, water, oil, different type of transportation system. Limited. Uh, you could extend this maybe to electricity if you expand your definition of a pipeline. Uh, but you know, uh, transportation is very important. Of course, the last method is uh, the most recent method. Method is the internet. And if I ask people, you know, what can you what can you uh, receive through the internet? And people say, well, everything. You know, you go to Amazon and order. But it doesn't come to you through the internet. It comes to you via a truck or some other method. Um, but there are certain products which you can receive through the internet, and that is anything that can be digitized. So that would be, you know, music, books, uh, software, um, certain services, consultation services. I give you one example. Um, there was a, a doctor and a radiologist in Chicago, and uh, he decided, for personal and religious reasons, that he and his family were going to move to Israel. Um, which of course you would think that would end his employment at the local hospital in Chicago. However, it actually made him more valuable because a radiologist uh, essentially doesn't really treat patients. They look at you know, x-rays and scans and other things and do a diagnosis based on what they see. What they were doing were, was just, and, and actually having a radiologist on staff at night is uh, more costly because often there's a lot, not a lot to do. And, uh, nobody really enjoys working a night shift. So what they did, since he was now in a different time zone, he could be on staff during the day. 
And what they would do is they would simply digitally transmit the uh, x-ray or the scan. He would give his diagnosis, send it back to them, uh, and it, it worked just fine. Um, so it was actually better for, for the hospital as well as for him. Uh, other things you can, uh, you know, photographs, um, I, for instance, I license photographs uh, on the internet um, and songs and things like that. Um, and films, movies, um, databases, you know, these can all be delivered. Um, and in general, it's essentially information. A physical product, let's say like this cup, I can't ship the cup, but what I could do is transmit the design of the cup, uh, 3D, uh, you know, and, and it could be 3D printed. So if the customer has a 3D printer, they can do that. And they do this on the space shuttle, I'm mean, not space shuttle, on the space station. Uh, they have a 3D printer up there. If they need a new type of tool or a new component, they, up, they transmit the design and then they 3D print it on the space station. Um, and 3D printers are becoming much cheaper. Um, uh, you know, some are not much more, some are uh, along the same price line as a uh, price level as a regular printer. And obviously there's some that are more expensive. And uh, this had a lot of interesting work being done in 3D printing uh, and uh, 3D technology. Uh, it isn't just 3D plastic, uh, printing plastics. Um, I know somebody who actually had a silver uh, necklace uh, printed for his wife. He, he designed it himself, sent it off, and then it, now he didn't, he didn't, he did have to have a ship because he didn't have a metal printer in his home, but a lot of interesting work there. Uh, even in the area of medicine, uh, uh, 3D printing stem cells is, is, uh, and I know of one case where there was a, a person who had the outer part of the fleshy part of his ear, he had lost in an accident. And what they did was the doctors scanned his other ear, reversed the design, and you can do that in 3D uh, software. And then they, they printed it with stem cells and then sewed it onto his, the side of his head, uh, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and they are talking about doing other things. And that's more of a, uh, technology discussion that I won't, I won't delve into too much now, but uh, we could see this development occur, you know, projected forward a little bit. You know, maybe people will have 3D printers in their homes uh, and buy the design and print it up. Anyway, um, so that, anyway, that covers uh, the discussion on distribution. And in your marketing courses, you will, of course, go into distribution uh, in much more in depth than we've just talked about here. Uh, promotion uh, is another area, the last P, uh, sometimes called integrated marketing communications. Um, and there are various branches. Uh, the most obvious one is advertising. Now we use the word, people use the word advertising very loosely, almost like to mean any sort of, sometimes they use it in place of the word marketing, sometimes they use it in place of uh, the word promotion. Uh, for our purposes, advertising is paid media that promotes a product or service. So we buy an ad uh, on, a, on a website or we buy time on a, a TV channel or space in a magazine or newspaper. So these are, <clears throat> excuse me, this is what we mean by advertising. Uh, there are people, some people who use it in a more general sense and we just make, need to make sure we understand the difference. Uh, another branch uh, is called public relations. Uh, and this is where we are trying to build good relationships with various publics uh, to create a desirable image for our company and its products. What do we mean by various publics? Well, the most obvious public that we're interested in are potential buyers or customers. Uh, it could be distributors, it could also be uh, government regulators, investors, in some cases it's employees. Uh, many people who work in the public relations field often don't consider themselves in the marketing field. And it's you know, some kind of, and often was the way you see an organization organized, um, they don't usually report to the marketing vice president or marketing managers. They tend to be in a, in a different, uh, a different line of command or chain of command. 
Um, and I've met some really good marketing, I'm, I'm sorry, really good public relations people, but I've also met some public public relations people who, you know, just just think it's about getting the CEO famous or you know something like that. And it, again, it depends upon the person what their background and experiences are. So you have to be uh, sort of careful about that. Um, personal sales, and this is where you have a sales rep uh, make personal presentations. They're usually part of a company's sales force. Uh, there's nothing really more powerful than having a, a personal interaction with a sales rep. Um, a sales rep can present the same information an ad can, but can usually present more, can develop a personal relationship, can respond to questions, can address concerns or objections to the product. Um, they can, in some cases, negotiate. Uh, so personal sales is very powerful. Unfortunately, salespeople also want to be paid. So, uh, you know, salaries, uh, expenses, commissions, there are other expenses, travel, that sort of thing associated with uh, having sales reps, like any, like any uh, employee. Uh, so you want to be very careful about when do you employ salespeople? Uh, is it worth it? You know, will they recover their costs? So there is very much a productivity issue here, hiring the right person to, you know, to, uh, to represent you and sell your product. And there, there has to be a lot of, you know, usually a lot of sales training uh, to get the maximum out of your sales reps. <clears throat> sales promotions are usually short-term incentives to encourage sales. Like, you know, if you buy two, you get a free gift that kind of thing is again, often it's used for clearances or you want to get product uh, sold quickly. And that's why it's tactical um, and short term as opposed to strategic and long term and big picture. Um, sometimes people use the term sales promotions to refer to product or things like giveaway items like um, yeah, here I have, a, I, have a, uh, I have a squeeze ball here. But the squeeze ball says, if you can see it, has a name and logo up as it's the Summit Medical Group. Um, so anytime I squeeze it, I think of the Summit Medical Group. Um, actually, they've just changed their name to Summit Health. So Summit Health. So they're probably going to give away more squeeze balls or something else. And you, you've seen things like this, pens and pencils, T-shirts, hats. These are things that are usually given away. Uh, sometimes they call premium, they're called premium items, um, you know, um, swag um you know giveaways all sorts of names for it uh, and some people throw that into the sales promotions but sales promotions are really meant to be incentives that encourage sales but not everyone always agrees on the same vocabulary so it helps to understand that the last area uh direct marketing is the oldest form of promotion and the newest form at the same time uh, as where you target uh, customers with direct communications. Um, you know, like years ago, it was with sending out brochures. The earliest form of direct marketing that we know of was 1667, when a, uh, a, <clears throat> a gardener in England named Lu uh, Lucas uh, sent out brochures of his uh, bulbs and uh, shrubs, and you know, he was selling uh, you know, basically selling uh, bulbs and shrubs and seeds and stuff. And this, as far as we know, that's the earliest form we know. But catalogs have been, you know, communicating directly with uh, consumers and yielding measurable responses. And that's one of the things we, that's really important about that is, can we get measurable responses? Uh, if I send out a thousand um, postcards, with an offer in it. And usually there needs to be an offer. Not, it's not just a straight advertisement. There's an offer, something for them to respond to. You know, we will take 10% off if you, you know, if you, if you buy before, uh, you know, the end of the month, something like that. So, um, and this of course has become much more sophisticated thanks to computers and databases and the internet and digital printing and a whole range of other technologies. Um, and people have become much more sophisticated with that. And, uh, and of course, when you're building databases, you're holding on to a lot of sensitive information for people. So you need to keep it more secure. So there's that. 
Um, anyway, so uh, now the one people, somebody will ask me the question, well, where does social media fall in? And there's actually no agreement within the industry. Uh, some people will say it's part of advertising. Okay, that makes sense. Public relations, okay, that could be makes sense. Direct marketing, that makes sense. I have one person, one dean at uh, the university said he felt it was part of personal sales. I don't feel it fell there, but there is no there is no agreement. Uh, so you, we could call it a, the, the sixth branch of marketing communications, and that's that's completely fine. Um, so. Uh, but the one thing is that all these different promotional tools must work together. If your if your advertising, for instance, is touting the high quality of your product, but your salespeople are trying to sell on price, that conflicts. You know, it's like a choir. You need everyone to harmonize, everyone to be singing the same notes, and sometimes that that doesn't always work out. Sometimes that's an issue of organization. For instance, if you have a sales force that reports to one vice president and the marketing area that ha handles advertising reports to another er another person, uh, they may not be on the same on the same page in the same book. So uh, that's important. And the same thing with public relations and uh, other aspects of promotion, and as well as social media. So uh, there are various types of advertisers. Um, we have manufacturers, of course, um, and you know, we, we know these Nike, Apple, you know, all these other you know, companies that manufacture products. Also, there are service providers. Um, you know, Verizon provides telephone services. H&R Block provides uh, tax preparation services. Gardeners, doctors, uh, you know, lawyers are all service providers, and they can advertise. Uh, when I started my uh, company, I thought most of my clients would be manufacturers or service providers. And at first they were, but then they moved on to a different type. And I'll get to that type in a moment. Because um, uh, I didn't really think of other types of advertisers, other types of customers. Um, resellers, certainly, uh, you know, Walmart and Target, they do a lot of uh, promotion, uh, advertising. Uh, so there's that. Um, also not-for-profit organizations um, do that you know they, they're always promoting uh, their charity or their whatever their mission is and actually I found a lot of my clients ended up being not-for-profit organizations so um, there's actually a fair amount of profit and not-for-profit so uh, the government's Governments advertise. Now, this seems counterintuitive because you really don't have your choice. If you're in a particular place, you don't have your choice of government. You know, I can't say I, I'd like to abide by the uh, the laws of Nevada if I live in New Jersey. I can't do that. I have to go live by the New Jersey laws. I have to live by the laws of the United States if I live in America. You know, if I want to change my government, I have to move to another jurisdiction. However, governments uh, do advertise. Probably the most common advertiser, at least on the federal level, would be the U.S. military. They're not trying to get you to buy anything. They're trying to recruit you, uh, recruit at least, or at least recruit certain people, um, specifically uh, you know 18 to 21 year olds uh, who uh, are young and can be molded into soldiers and sailors and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and there are other, you know, they they will have, they will promote. Um, other uh, types of services from time to time as well. Uh, political groups, which is separate from the governments because governments are not allowed to pay for elections, uh, at least uh, on behalf of candidates. Um, in the last election, I believe over $4 billion was spent on campaign, uh, you know, on campaigns for the presidency. Um, and that's, you know, that's not a new thing. The last few, uh, presidential elections have caught, you know, have been similar uh, in their scope. Um, and, and smaller down ballot races also. And also ag advocacy groups, activists can uh, advertise as well. You know, think of, uh, you know, um, you know, PETA or uh, some other ones that, uh, you know, have activist groups who are trying to get certain people elected or trying to get certain laws passed or certain referendums passed. 
California is particularly known for its referendums uh, that they have the entire uh, state vote on. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that was the last of these groups. So, you know, there's always a lot of people who are willing to promote, to advertise, and there are different types. Um, so everyone engages in marketing uh, at some point. Uh, there are various advertising issues. Uh, one is that there's an increasing number of communication channels. Uh, just looking at television, when I grew up, there were three networks plus PBS, but nobody ever, you couldn't advertise on PBS. Maybe there were a handful of uh, uh, you know, local channels, but I think I, I grew up in the New York area and you know the, the four networks and then I think there was channel five, channel nine and channel 11. So there were six commercial stations available. When I went on vacation, went into other areas, I surprised they only had those three networks. It seemed a little weird to me. Now, we have hundreds of cable channels. Add to that the radio radio uh, stations. Add to that all the websites. You know, um, you know the, the 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 ways you can communicate. The channels in which you can communicate have exploded, which means uh, there are fewer eyeballs or ears on each one of them. So you actually now have to promote through a wider range of communication channels. Generally, if you want to sell a product, you know, in the 1960s, um, you just had primarily, you know, put TV ads on the, the three networks and you were good. You know, um, maybe you want to supplement with some print ads, but outside of that, uh, that was it. Now you have to you have to be very careful. You have to pick which channels reach your target audience or your target market uh, best. Another challenge is breaking through the clutter because we have so much communication. How do we get heard? If there are a million other people, you know, shouting, buy my product, we want people to buy our product. How do we break through that clutter? How, how do we break through that noise? Well, we have to do something special, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, let's say we're brilliant or we have a brilliant ad agency and they create an ad that breaks through that clutter, that, you know, outshouts all competitors and all people advertising. Uh, we're not simply advertising directly in competition to you, but just trying to get get paid attention to. Congratulations, you got an ad that just broke through the clutter. Congratulations, you now also added to the clutter. So that's uh, that's a challenge there. So it's always getting you have to get louder and louder and louder. Uh, also, people are figuring out ways to avoid. Um, advertising because we went from uh, being inv information starved to information overload and product placement has been around for a while but it kind of went away um, but then there was the creation of the vcr so now people could record the shows and watch them at a later time and what they would often do was be to zip through or fast forward through the commercials so this makes, uh, for instance, TV advertising a little bit harder to uh, uh, to be harder to be effective. Uh, with di some digital DVRs and streaming services, they've prevented you from uh, doing that. Can't fast forward uh, through a certain certain things, um, but you can walk out of the room and come back, and you can rewind to the point. One solution to this is placing products within the content of the show. And so you might see a character, you know, drinking, uh, you know, a Lipton green tea uh, beverage or some other beverage. Um, and that's being paid for, you know, uh, by, by the company. They're paying to have their uh, product in the, uh, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the content. And you see this in movies as well. If you look at the movie Castaway uh, from a few years ago uh, with Tom Hanks, Basically, uh, the big the big stars there were FedEx because he was a FedEx employee. Um, I mean, UPS could have he could have been a UPS employee, um, but FedEx paid for that to be. In fact, Fred Smith, the president, the CEO of FedEx, actually had a cameo in the in the movie. Um, and then, of course, the the volleyball Wilson. Um, but if, if Wilson, the Wilson a Sporting Goods Company hadn't paid for Wilson, the volleyball to be there, the Spalding Company could have paid for 
for it. Um, so there are opportunities uh, there. Um, and and you see, if you watch if you watch television programs, uh, you'll often see uh, products in there. Sometimes they're referred to. Uh, sometimes they're just there. Uh, sometimes if if what was it? I was remember watching. Uh, there's a show with Aston Kutcher called The Ranch, and there's lots, tons of product placement in there. It's it's, it's sort of amazing. Um, anyway. Um, there are also various types of marketing communication agencies. Uh, the most common is the full service ad agency. They will uh, create the ad, you know, they do the creative, do the copywriting and the art direction. They will place the ads on television or in magazines or online or wherever that needs to be. Uh, they'll do the research, any market research. They, they will do a whole range of things. If you um, ever watch the television show Mad Men, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's, that essentially shows a full service ad agency from the 1960s. There's no internet going on, but television is just taking off and they're starting to do TV commercials. And, you know, it's a show that's, again, it, it's, it's a dramatic show, but it takes place for the most part at an ad agency. So they also have boutique agencies. Boutique agencies are small agencies that focus on the creative work the copywriting and uh, the uh, uh, art direction. Uh, many full service ad, ad agencies started as boutique agencies. And uh, in fact, sometimes they'll outsource if they have too much work to outsource to a boutique agency. Uh, my, my company is technically a boutique agency. Uh, we have design agencies. Uh, design agencies focus on the visual, usually the visual design. Uh, they do logos and uh, trade show graphics. Some of them might design packaging, um, you know, a signage, that sort of thing. Um, some kind of dip their toe and also are, are blur the difference between a design agency and a boutique agency that happens. Uh, there are also media buying groups. Media buying groups are uh, companies. Well, what, what's happened with um, a lot of the full service ad agencies is they've been bought up by major holding companies. And there are like five major holding companies, the Saatchi Group, um, Omnicom, um, I forget some of the others. Um, and what they do is <clears throat> they consolidate the ad purchasing and get the economy of scale. So imagine you are a a, an ad salesperson at CBS, for instance, and I come in and I say, I'm, 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 I'm selling a product here and I've got, uh, I want to buy 100 TV spots. What they'll do is they'll pull out their standard, standard uh, rate card and say, okay, 100 spots under these conditions will cost X amount of dollars. However, if I come in and I say, well, I'm from uh, Omnicom or uh, some other company, and I, I'm, I'm placing ads for McDonald's, for Nike, for Apple, um, for General Motors, for you know, a few other companies. And I'm, I'm going to be bringing you, you know, I'm going to be buying a lot of advertising. Uh, you're going to give me a better rate. And that's what ad buying groups do. They, they consolidate the ad buying uh, to get those quantity discounts. They also analyze uh, media and uh, get better, uh, you know, do better ad placement. Um, we have public relations agencies, you know, these people are writing, you know, press releases and um, trying to influence third parties, you know, the press and others. Uh, it's not advertising per se. Um, <clears throat> and often uh, you'll keep your PR agency step separate from your full, full service ad agency, but sometimes, but the full service ad agency will be more than glad to do your PR work as well. So. And then you have production companies. Uh, production companies are the people who physically produce the ads. So uh, they are the photographers, the uh, illustrators, um, you know, TV directors, uh, model makers. There's a whole bunch of production specialties. And uh, so there's that. Uh, we have various types of advertising media, um, print ads, newspapers, magazines, Newspapers tend to come out daily or maybe weekly. Magazines, weekly, maybe monthly. 
Um, newspapers are usually very up to date. It's very usually very easy usually to place an ad with them on short notice because they're they're, they're a much faster uh, organization. Magazines usually take a little bit more advance notice, but like. <clears throat> Uh, it would be possible to decide today that I wanted an ad to run in the Newark Star Ledger tomorrow. And if I have the art ready and I, I can make the call, um, you know, I can make that happen. Um, you know, just uh, usually, I mean, usually you have to have a relationship with the newspaper ahead of time, but that's not a, that big a deal. But you could, on very short notice, place ads. Um, of course, we have television. I mentioned previously that you know there, there's the major networks, uh, but now we have cables. There are cable channels, which are specialty channels. You know, um, there's the you know, sports channels. There are movie channels. There are documentary channels. There are uh, partisan news channels. There are uh, history channels. There are all sorts of whatever your interest. Food channels, yeah, all that. So, and then of course local channels that are much more key to uh, the local locale. Uh, radio, which has been declared dead several times. Um, you know, when television came out, oh, radio's on the way out, they said. When the internet started, radio's on the way out. Radio survives primarily because you can what you can drive a car and listen to radio. Um, so, um, So, you know, that's, of course, it's audio only, but that's fine. Um, outdoor, billboards, uh, subway signs, buses, um, you know, uh, anywhere. Um, and there's a wide range of, of uh, options with outdoor advertising, sometimes referred to as out of home advertising. Um, I'm sure you've seen that. Of course, you cannot control who sees it. It's it, it reaches a lot of people, but very quickly, you know, very briefly, actually, and um, not everyone who sees the billboard will be a likely customer. Uh, whereas if you if you choose a magazine or a cable channel, you're you're marketing to a specific type of person, usually based on the demographics of the people who read or watch uh, that medium. We also have point of purchase displays. Uh, we put in store. They're sometimes called POP or POS for point of sale. These are little displays in the store uh, to encourage, you know, purchase uh, impulse buys and so forth. And of course, we have web or online advertising, you know, various websites, banner ads placed all over the place and in social media sites, but social media sites or websites too. Uh, and then the last is collateral or brochures. This is a little bit different. Mo most advertise most advertising agencies are compensated through a 15% commission on media. So if, if my agency places an ad for you, uh, I would get 15% of the buy of, of the, uh, the price you pay to the media. And it's it kind of built into the system. So um, a lot of big agencies don't like to do collateral because all they can do is charge for the printing and, and the, uh, just, they don't make as much money on it. Uh, a detailer is something a salesperson would use when making a sales call. It is another type of collateral material. Okay. Personal sales uh, has a process. Um, and I said personal sales is a very strong thing, a strong tool. Uh, the first part is, uh, of course, prospecting. You have to find customers. Where are the customers? Who are they? You know, let's find them. And that's part of the sales process. Now, if you're a sales clerk in the store, you don't have to do any prospecting. They just come in themselves if they're interested. But if you're a professional sales rep who has to go out and make presentations to uh, potential clients or customers, you have to do a lot of prospecting. Um, and you, you know, you're looking for leads, you're looking for referrals, um, you're trying to reconnect with old customers, that sort of thing. We also need to qualify them. And um, we use something called the MAD criteria uh, you know, not every prospect is necessarily going to be likely to be a good customer. You know, so we use the MAD criteria, MAD. Do they have enough money? Do they have the authority to make a purchase? And do they have the desire? Would they have, would it be logical that they would have a des desire to buy that kind of product? So, 
And then you need to do some pre-approach planning. If you're going to make a sales call, you need to learn as much about them as possible. And that's what I do. Anytime I'm going to reach out to someone, I do my research. I go to their website. I talk to people who might know these people, you know, learn about much about them. And then we make the approach. Um, and this is very much about personal interaction. How do you come across? How is somebody dressed? How are they, you know, how are they groomed? How do they speak? Um, how do they shake hands? Now that seems it's kind of silly, but there are people who don't shake hands very well. You know, uh, and I've had people who give you, know, they give you the dead fish handshake or the, the bone crusher, or I had one person who would always give me a slap. That was the way they hand, shook hands. Um, that was not good. It should be, you know, if you call this the web, you go in one, two, three, strong, but not, not crushing. Um, and you know, you have, how do you connect with people? People make an assessment of you and a first impression within seven seconds. That's all it takes. Now, it doesn't mean you can't say, change that uh, impression, but you only have one chance to make a first impression. And salespeople know how to do that. Um, and then you come to the pitch, the presentation, which could be a PowerPoint. It could be a, but more like it might be a demonstration, a product demonstration. In many cases, it's just going to be a talk, a discussion between two people, two or more people, um, asking questions. The best salespeople ask good questions. Um, you know, the wor one of the worst questions uh, I've ever uh, I hear in sales is, uh, can I help you? Which seems like a natural question to ask, and I'm sure you've heard it in, in stores. Can I help you? That's a terrible question because often people will say no, and then you can't, you're locked out. So I never ask that question. I ask, what are you looking for today? Or how could I help you today? Which forces them to give a different kind of answer. Um, and you learn to you know, learn to ask questions which pull out information that you can use to make a, a sale. You know, find out about what people's needs are, what are their desires, what do they, what do they don't want, what do they hate, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and during that time, you also handle objections. And objections, I don't mean people saying, I object to your product. No, no, it's concerns. Things like the price objection. You know, people are always, no, people don't want to pay more, they want to pay less. So that's, uh, uh, and, and of course, as a salesperson and as a marketer, you want people to pay more. So there's an area of conflict. Um, I never, I tell people, never start with a price. Never talk about price until you get your customer or potential customer to love the product. Once they love it, then you reveal the price. So. <clears throat> and then you can do something called a trial close. Um, you check to see how close you are to getting them to say yes. And you ask them a question, not to buy the product, but you know some ch choices they would make. And I remember one case, I was, I was helping a team sell some interactive software uh, that's, and uh, it was going to be custom software and so we had our initial meeting we learned a lot about what they were thinking about we came back with a demonstration of a you know, preliminary demonstration of the way this could work um, and things seemed to be going well so then I, I, I kind of decided to do a test close I pulled out some uh, <clears throat> boards of uh, illustrations of what the graphic user interface might look like. And that means how it would appear on the screen. And I got an interesting reaction. Uh, they said, well, you know, I, I'm not really sure we're ready to make that kind of decision. At that point, I knew something was wrong. Something they, they were, there was an objection there. And turns out the objection was that they weren't really sure they wanted a soft a piece of software they um they were also thinking they might want a website and uh and at that time we didn't do the the company i was representing didn't do the websites the kind of websites that they were looking for so um and it's good that I, at least i tried it with the trial close because we might have come back and wasted another another session you know with, with, when they they want something else so uh, it tells us uh, things. And then of course you, you try to close, assuming that you've, your trial close has passed, uh, you actually actually have to ask for the sale. 
some people, I've seen some sales training sessions where you tell the sales rep didn't feel confident enough to ask for the sale. Okay, how many can I put you down for? How many, when would you want them delivered? That sort of thing. <clears throat> then of course there's follow-up. Um, you always wanna follow up, make sure your client or customer is happy with the product. Uh, and you see, you you know, you get, I just had, I, I, when I bought a new car a few years ago, I constantly would get, oh, how's everything going with the car, blah, blah, blah. They wanna make sure I'm happy. One is that they're, they're looking at the uh, post-purchase decisions that might be made such as buying another one later on, or if I'm unhappy, I might start telling people I wasn't happy and they wouldn't like that, you know, and, and they, you know, they don't want people uh, complaining about their product. So they want to stop, prevent complaining. So if there's a real problem, they want to, they want to deal with it, fix it. Um, if you are managing a sales force, there are various decisions you have to make. Uh, one is selecting uh, sales representatives. Um, yeah, do they have the right expertise? Now, depending upon the product you're selling, you might need a lot of expertise or very little expertise, but you have to make sure you know, they do that. Uh, do they, what's their personality? Yes, you want somebody who's outgoing, but you don't want somebody who's obnoxious. Um, you want somebody who's empathetic, who can connect with people, as opposed to the person who's just going to talk at people. And I came across one, uh, a number of sales reps, but one I remember in particular, he just, he was regurgitating features at me. Um, and he had a terrible personality. I mean, he was outgoing. He was, you know, he was trying to be positive, but his, he, he just didn't connect with me or, or my wife for that matter. Um, and also, you know, what's the motivation of the sales rep? Now, obviously the motivation is to get paid, but I guess how motivated are they going to be? And I'll give you one little story. Uh, we were interviewing some potential sales reps. And there was this one guy um, who was a little bit older and that was completely fine. Uh, he was ex-military, he was retired from the US military. That was great. Uh, so we knew he'd be disciplined. Um, and he you know, was intelligent and great personality, all that. He, uh, but he made a comment, said, well, you know, I don't really need this job, but I, I just, uh, I just want to see if I can do it, you know. And that on the surface wouldn't seem that negative, but well, we could have hired him and he might have been great. But part of me, us, a number of us felt, well, we have other sales reps who, are, who, are, who, are, who do need it, who are a little hungrier. This guy was not really hungry. He just, you know, I think he was just looking for some time to fill his retirement uh, hours, uh, retirement days. Um, so we decided to get someone and, uh, and I felt bad because I really liked this guy. I thought, you know, he had the potential to be a great sales rep, but if he wasn't motivated and, um, you know, you just, you wouldn't know. And, 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 and you know, we, you don't want to hire somebody and then fire them. You want to hire people you think can be successful. And I fired people in the past. I do not enjoy it. It's, and I don't know anyone who really does. So, um, sales training, people are going to have to be trained. Uh, they're going to have to be trained in the product. Um, going to be, have to train, be you know, trained on how to sell that product. Um, you know, the, uh, teaching them things not to say, le learning to say, ask open-ended questions as opposed to closed it closed ended questions like, can I help you? Which is a closed ended question, which often gets a response of no, that's why I don't like that question. Uh, and uh, probably there's, you know, administrative training as well. Uh, you need to design territories, different uh, salespeople need to be given territories, an area of responsibility. You don't want overlapping territories because then sales reps start fighting over sales. And also you want territories so you can measure you know, period after period, what's, you know, what, what is going on in that, in that sales territory? How are we doing there? So, uh, is the sales rep being successful? Is there not being successful? What's going on? Uh, and so you give, you narrow that down to tailor. And some of that, those, those territories are often geographic, but they could also be by product line. You know, if you look at General Electric, this, the people who sell the, um, Airplane engines are not, not the people who are selling the appliances and they're not the people who are selling the locomotives. If you've got different product lines, you need a different, different sales forces for each product line. Um, 
and also by customer type. For instance, um, my wife uh, used to be an inside sales rep. By, in by inside sales rep, I mean uh, she didn't go out and meet customers. She stayed in the office and did it by telephone. And she was selling uh, support. Uh, what the company does, the company sold uh, lab equipment, you know, and big machines that would, you know, analyze things and do things uh, for, for bi biological or pharmaceutical research. And what she sold were, you know, filters and, uh, you know, the, the tubes and things like that, the little parts that you always have to replace. And the sales rep next to her in the next cubicle was responsible for selling the same products. They had the same geographic territory, the Eastern Seaboard. The difference was uh, she only sold to a certain type of product. She sold to pharmaceutical research laboratories and he sold to university research laboratories. They had different cultures. Uh, each came from that culture. My wife used to work in a research lab, uh, a pharmaceutical research lab. And uh, this other gentleman worked in a, uh, a university research lab. So uh, they understood the different cultures, the different ways of funding, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, it needs to be clear which sales rep is responsible for you know, which, uh, which customers, which products, which you know, uh, uh, customer type, that sort of thing. Uh, also, there's issues of compensation. Uh, that's one of the biggest motivators for sales reps. And we're talking about, you know, salaries versus commissions and so forth. Um, you know, salary, salary is for, you give a salary, you're paid a salary if you take a certain responsibility, you're given certain responsibilities. Wages are time-based. Um, so, so much per hour, so much per day. So, um, and then of course there are sales commissions. Uh, so based on how much you sell. Not every sales rep receives his sales commissions. It depends on the situation. <clears throat> and then we also have supervision. Uh, you have to supervise your sales reps. If you are supervising sales clerks in a store, that's fairly easy. You can observe them directly. If you are, um, if you have sales reps who go out in their car by themselves to visit with customers, it's hard to supervise them directly, but uh, you will certainly be able to evaluate them based on their sales numbers, based on reports that you get back from people, that sort of thing. And of course, you have to motivate them. You can motivate them, yes, with compensation, you know, salary, wages, sales, commissions, but also through other things. There are awards and uh, things like my son just hit it, made a big sale and he is actually going to blow away his, uh, his yearly sales target and he's going to be uh, inducted in something called the President's Club. And it's something he can put on his, uh, on his uh, business card. And that gives him a certain status. Again, um, if you think of, Ma remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, yes, uh, money, uh, compensation helps you be, uh, helps you survive and makes you secure. But often there are other motivators as well, such as status. And uh, the company I worked in, we inducted uh, sales reps into the circle of excellence and there was a whole bunch of you know perks attached to that. So there are various ways to motivate salespeople. Okay. All right. Uh, obviously, you uh, can't offer me questions right now, but uh, when we get back in uh, in class, uh, you can ask me all the classes questions you want, and I would encourage you to do so. So, uh, in that case, uh, take care. See you in class.